So here's the not so nice part about all this integrated wise. And we see God talk about it, but we don't think about the implications, or at least I didn't until lately. You know where he says valley made high, mountain made low. Then in another place he talks about, um, you know, Christ was talking about how a guy finds a treasure in a field and then he, he's so excited, he runs out and he, he buys the whole field, not just the treasure part, the whole field. And then the pearl of great price, which of course the Mormons abuse because they don't understand anything. They're anti-Semitic. The whole Mormonism thing is anti-Semitic, so that's why. Any any denomination founded on anti-Semitism, like Catholicism, Mormonism, Catholic, JW, SDA, they're all, they're all wacko because they're founded on anti-Semitism. But that's really the point. He's gonna, but he's, he's talking about you find the pearl and everything around it, everything around it, you buy. Not just the pearl. Okay? The guy finds a treasure in a field and he buys the whole field. Parable of the sower is similar also. The guy shaking out seed, you know, in the old days what you did, the way you, you planted a field, was that you had um, what looked like a, a really long sickle, but it was actually a plow, and you dig it in the ground, because the ground was usually hard, and then you, you know, like move up the the handle in order to break up the ground and then you do it again and again and again and again and it would take hours and hours and hours to do that so that you've got the broken up ground usually about 12 inches 6 inches broken up and then you have a whole bag of what was your seed crop from the prior year seeds seed crop meaning what you're going to use to grow your next crop for food and because you didn't only just grow for food, you grew also a seed crop so that you could have seeds for the next crop next year. Okay, so then you had this big burlap bag that was slung over your shoulder, and you've seen this in the movies. And then people would put stick their hand in the bag where there's a bunch of seed, and they would just scatter the seed, scatter the seed, scatter the seed horizontally okay, or sometimes vertically, the idea being that some of it would fall in the furrow that you just dug with your plow, and some of it would fall on the ground, and some of it, it depends on where your, your field is, might even go into the, you know, the street or the road alongside your field. That's what Christ was talking about when he told the parable of the sower. And what he said was, is that, you know, some of the seed is going to fall in the wrong place and it's not going to grow. In other words, the the soil or the ground was the volition of the hearer. That's the analogy that he makes when you listen to him explain it. And so some people are going to hear the gospel all their lives and it's not going to mean anything to them. They're just not interested. The answer is no. So they're not going to, they're not going to sprout. They're going to be dead to God, and God is dead to them, and that's why hell lasts forever. That's part of the field, buying the whole field of humans. Okay? The, the rest of it, the majority, in fact, and I'll explain how you know that, the majority, in fact, of those who even sprout, that's, they, they, they just sprout. They don't, they don't grow up to fruition. They don't grow up to mature. And just a very few mature. See, you can't become a tree until you're first a seed and sprout and grow into a tree. And not until you're a tree for a certain amount of time can you bear fruit. That's why all these baby Christians who will never grow up are always talking about fruit bearing. They'll never grow up. They'll never bear fruit. They think that, that fruit bearing is works. Uh-uh. That's because they're immature. They aren't even trees yet. So they're not fruit-bearing, but they account themselves as fruit-bearing. No, not even thinking how, they're, how wrong they are. You have to spend time growing up first. You go from a seed to a plant 
to a tree. And then after you've been a tree for a long enough time, if you look in the Bible especially, then you have your first crop. And God says, don't harvest that crop. Then your second crop, don't harvest that crop. Then God says, your third crop, that you harvest. Those are the rules. I forget if they're in Deuteronomy or... Um, it should be in Deuteronomy or Numbers. Maybe they're in Leviticus. should be in Leviticus. In other words, that's at least three years after a tree is a tree before you can harvest the crop. All right? So there's a great deal of time where the plant is being cared for by someone else, getting water to it, possibly fertilizer to it, protecting it from bugs. And that takes at least a year or two or three or more to grow into a tree. I got some trees that I planted that are out in my backyard. You know, that I planted from a grapefruit and I forget what else. And I've had those, I've had those now for like, I don't know, five, six years. And they're like a foot and a half tall. They're not true trees yet. They're beginning to show the leaves of the tree. But they're like only a foot and a half tall. So they're not bearing fruit yet. I might be dead before they're big enough. Because trees take a while to grow. So do people. That's the point of the seed parable. That everybody grows and grows and grows. And you're not getting anything out of it. In fact, you're the one spending the trouble. Watering. Fertilizing. Keeping them free from bugs. And depending on the kind of plant or tree that it is. You move it around maybe to get the best of the sun. Okay. That's a lot of work. For what? See, that's the same thing as buying a whole field because in one small section of the field there's a little bit of treasure. You're going to a lot of trouble and taking care of a lot of everything else for the sake of that little itty bit. And then when Christ is talking about the seed parable, he's saying that those few, and this is how come you know they're few, make up for the loss because their crop is 60, 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. Now think about that. 30 fold means 30 times more than the seeds, the other seeds. If it's 30 times more, then that's a 3% roughly. 3% of the total doing the job for the total. See, 3 times 30 is 90. It's a little more than 3%. So that means that 97% of Christians never grow up. So the 3% is carrying the 97%. If 3% is doing 30-fold, then it's okay that the rest of it didn't grow. Okay, and then he said, and some will do 60-fold. Okay, that's 1.5%. Because it's doing the job, it's doing 60 times the job that it needs to do as one tree. It's doing 60 times the job. So then it's, that means that 98.5% of Christians aren't growing and 1.5% are. And actually it's not just growing, it's growing to maturation. And then in the final analysis, 100 times. Well, that's an easy no-brainer. That means 99%, you've heard me say this before, 99% of Christianity is in the toilet. 1% grows to maturity. 1%. And in the Luke version of the seed parable, he makes it real specific. Not growing to, you know, growing to maturity. Producing fruit, growing to maturity. Not just being a tree. Not just being implanted, which is analogous to being saved. Just like Dave, James said in James 121, receive the implanted word. Implanted means you got saved. But what's, what's growing from it? See the difference? Paul uses the same analogy. They all do. Believers are likened to a crop. Okay, but not all the seeds grow. Not all the seeds even sprout. The ones that don't sprout are humans who don't believe in the gospel. Okay. 
And where do they go? To hell. And how long does hell last? Forever. That's an integration. It's all the seeds. Is the first level of integration. All the seeds, believers and unbelievers alike. They are all given the freedom. This is a killer for me. Because that's what this is all about to God. They are all given the freedom to do and be whatever they want. And he will underwrite and ensure their freedom. Freedom has its own consequences and effects. God knows what those consequences and effects ought to be. He ensures them so that your life is truly free. And so is whatever happens to you. Now God can take anything that happens to you and turn it to profit. So it doesn't really matter what happens to you. If you go to him, you can profit from anything, no matter how bad or how good. That's another kind of freedom. That you can be free of what would otherwise be a bad thing. You can get free from that and get good out of it anyhow. That's the triumph of being in the spiritual life. That Christ even went to the cross and it was a happiness to him. That's what Hebrews 12 2 tells you. So that's what God's out to do. Is, ha ha, this thing was supposed to wreck your life. You got sick, you got hurt, you got this, you got that. And guess what? You're happy. Like Paul said, what was that? I have learned in whatever circumstances I am to be content. God is really about freedom. This whole thing is about freedom. But it has ramifications that are not pleasant. It, it, his real, the first, and in many ways the only righteousness is, be free. If it's not free, it's not righteous, no matter what it is. Satan disputes that. Satan says, well, you know, you ought to be a good person. And no matter what one has to do to get you to be a good person, being a good person is the be-all and end-all. No, it isn't. Being free is the be-all and end-all. So if you don't want to believe in him, you're not going to die. You're going to be free to have the world that you want that's away from him. Okay, but what must therefore be the free characteristics of such a world? Hell. So fine, you can have your own home alone. And as far as, you know, your life is concerned, you're totally apart from God. He's actually running it. He's actually preserving it. He's actually preserving you. But the characteristics of the world that is apart from him is what you get. And you can keep right on having it. Or you are forever alive, so you are forever free to change your mind and say, you know what, I don't want to live here anymore. I believe Jesus Christ paid for my, my sins. Zip. Out you go, away from hell and into heaven. Okay, but what's heaven like? What is heaven like? I'm finding out now, and I'm not too happy about it, that it's not a whole lot different from being down here. Except there's no sin component. The reason is that everybody's free to elect the kind of life he wants to live. And the more you elect to live a life that's like, hello, I want God in everything I think and say and do, because that's the only enjoyable way to live, then that's what you'll get. And in God's world, in heaven, that puts you at the top of society. In this world, that puts you at the bottom of society. Even when you're at the top of society, people will find ways to avoid you. God is just used as a tool for self-aggregation, for self, um, what do you want to call it? To promote the self, God is named as, is named a lot. But it's only in order to promote self. It's all one great big lie down here. The more money you have, the more you have to worry about how you promote yourself. And people basically want money so they can be free of need, free of society. To go off a lot of people, 
lot of people have money. What they really want is to buy that piece of real estate out in Podunk somewhere. And they can just live them by themselves. And then they come into town to do whatever they got to do to keep the money flow going. And then they want to go back away. As far away from people as possible. Because they learned, they learned the hard way. You know, being around people is not fun. It isn't. People are extremely petty and, and just, they, they love lying and they're just, they're just awful. They're low life. They can be very endearing too, but boy oh boy, the less you have to spend time around them, the better. And when you get, when you get fame and wealth and money and popularity, all the things that people drool over. When you get those things, you start to learn to hate the human race. Because you see how grabby everybody is. And you hardly regret that you worked so hard to get what you got. So now you start to look for, you know, some place off in a mountain. Some place far away. And you want to be there as much as possible. And you're not necessarily very happy there either. And usually along the way you've gotten married and you've gotten kids and they're not too nice either. So it's really hard. It's really hard to, to have money. But in God's society, all oh, that's different. In God's society, because you want God all over your life, you want everything in your life to involve Him and be a direct, bi-directional conversation with Him at all times. Because that's the only way you want to live. And you get that way when you mature. You really do. That's how Christ was, why Christ was leaving all the time, walking away from the crowds to be alone with Father. That's what puts you at the top of God's society. And yet you are away from the hoi polloi, the masses, who are still thinking low to the ground. And you have the money, you have the fame, you have the popularity. They will be drooling over you. I wish that weren't true, but it is. And what you want to do is take the advantage of all these things God's giving you to sort of like help them get a little more understanding of Him so they won't be so low anymore. And that's your job forever. It's a job you love. It's parental. They will always be low and slow and small and petty and, Oh, this. Oh, that. The king wore this today. The king ate that yesterday. Oh, I saw the king's fingers at, you know, five feet. I was five feet away from the king's vehicle. Ah, oh. and then, you know, the, the the person runs back to the shop or wherever they work and talks about it and everybody talks with them. That matters to those people because that's the life that they've elected. They've elected low like they did down here. And down here they might have been famous and rich, but they elected to be petty and small in their thinking. They didn't elect to learn and live on Bible. They didn't elect to grow up to a tree. They didn't elect to mature and uh, therefore start to bear fruit. Because bearing fruit in God's eyes is his thinking. Which, hello, if it's inside your head, the only one seeing it is God. That's fruit bearing. Fruit bearing means that there's so much of his thinking in your head. That you could, you could, as it were, power a whole kingdom. No, but nobody can see that. That's not doing anything for people that they can see. It's doing everything for people because now you are the pearl of great price and they are the field. So he buys all of them because of you and then he gives them to you. That's Isaiah 53, 12. That's the integration. Because you're growing in his thinking, they will be given to you so that your thinking can transfer 
to them and integrate them. And they will grow in his thinking. And of course, he hears it. So you're the pearl of great price. That's the kind of integration God's about. It's full spectrum. Perfection, in God's definition, is integrated full spectrum. Integrated full spectrum. Write it down. Integrated full spectrum. Now, I think a spectrum... It's depicted in many ways. You know, you can, you know, Google on spectrum picture. Because they usually think of it as spectrums of light, and that's true too. But in this particular case, think of a sheet of paper, or get out a sheet of paper, and draw a huge diagonal from the bottom left corner to the upper right corner. All across the page you have the pages bisected with a diagonal line, the whole page. The diagonal line starts at the very lower bottom left corner and ends at the very upper right corner. So that on either side you've got two triangles, isosceles triangles, and in the middle you've got that that you know big line. Okay. Now, every single dot along that line. is, as it were, I'm not sure if I'm going to say this right, but it's going to be close. Each dot along that line is some mature believer. Because, you know, there are different levels of maturity, too. It's some mature believer. On the left and on the right of that line are all the rest of the believers. And you'll notice that you know, if you were to go to the left or the right, you would have to stop at some point along the line and then go left or then go right. So that you could argue that if you were to draw um, transverse diagonal lines at every point along that first diagonal line, that you would be intersecting, you would have a lot of intersecting lines. Okay, kind of like a leaf, you know, the veins of a leaf, or a telephone, you know, uh, used to be considered to be a a television um, antenna, or a radio antenna, where you have bisecting, transverse lines. Okay, so then you have a whole swath of humans, which as it were intersect in the middle, that first diagonal line going across the whole page. So then you have all those other humans that are connected to that central diagonal line. You could call all those kingdoms. With millions upon millions of people in them. So that you become the center. See, integration also means centering. You become the center person. And they are drawing their sustenance, their spiritual sustenance, from you. You get it from God, but they didn't like to know Him directly. They elected instead to know each other, or their works, or their religion, or their rituals, or their good deeds. They didn't elect to know Him. You elected to know Him. He caused it to happen. It's not your power. You're not better. But God gives you what you want. They didn't want him. They wanted their good deeds and their friends and their this and their that and the other thing. So they're close to that. You wanted to know God. So you're close to him. So he gives to you and then it spreads out along that transverse line from whatever your point is on that long diagonal. It spreads out transversely to all of your subjects. Because they're getting it from you directly. Now the Holy Spirit's going to be indwelling all of us forever. But there is a path, a flow through, a throughput that is used. 
and it's going from high to low. If any talk to anybody who's a water engineer, and they'll tell you water always seeks the lowest place. So it is trickle down. It's trickle down spiritual economics. That's the way it always works. That's the way any economics works. And people who say it's not true, well, they don't understand economics. Or they're lying. There are a lot of liars out there. Anybody who wants to sell a particular point of view will lie in order to sell it. So you talk to God about this. Meaning of integrated wise. You being the 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And then he turns right around and gives those people to you as your kingdom so that what you learned under him can flow to them because they didn't elect to learn it directly from him you did so it flows through you to them you talk to him about that and then you'll understand wow then your life every day even when you take a shower it's going to have a lot more meaning to you and it's really um I don't want to put this it's very upsetting To realize that this is how it's going to stay. It's very upsetting to realize you're this important. If you want to be. I mean, you're not going to choose this and stick with it because it makes you important. You're going to choose this and stick with it because God is important. But the hard part of living with this knowledge is that people are always going to be like this. The way they are now, they're always going to be like this. Society in heaven is not a whole lot different from society down here. The sin component is removed, so you don't have, you know, murder and theft and envy and jealousy and all the rest of it. But you do have the shortfall. Romans 3.23 Man has sinned, well, that's the first indictment, but in heaven that's not true anymore, and come short of the glory of God. Well, yeah, that's still true, that'll always be true. And the mechanism that God has set up is, okay, you have to be free, otherwise there's no such thing as righteousness. So you will always be free to learn me a little more each day. You know, when it says in, what was it? Jeremiah 3.16 compared to, what was it? Jeremiah 31 verses 31 through 34. Um, all Everybody's going to know me. That was the new covenant promise that is covered in the book of Hebrews. Everybody's going to know me. Okay. A baby knows his mommy and his daddy. But what kind of knowledge does a baby have? A baby's knowledge. A baby knows his parents, he sees mommy or daddy, and his face all brightens up. But what kind of knowledge is that in a child? It's recognition. You don't really know your parents when you're a baby, because when you're a baby, you don't really know anything. The knowledge of a baby is, Hi, mommy, daddy. You don't really know the ins and outs of your parents. You don't know their character. You don't even know what character is when you're a baby. But you do know as a baby knows. So everybody will know me, God says in Jeremiah 3, 31, th verses 31 through 34. New covenant promise. Jeremiah three sixteen was, you're not even going to miss... You're not even going to miss the Ark of the Covenant because Nebuchadnezzar took it away, melted it down. You're not even going to miss it. Jeremiah 31, by the time he gets there, he's explaining why. Because everybody will know me directly. Yeah, but at what level? A baby's level? Yeah, some. Oh, God. God. Oh, God. Oh, God. And people in your kingdom will be like that. And it'll break your heart. You'll bend over backwards to give them a little more knowledge so they won't have so limited an understanding of him. And there will be some who will be a little older. And they will, you know, be assistants, as it were, 
in passing on the information and some a little older than them and some a little older than them so you will have your own sheet of paper with your own diagonal and those will be your subjects your people your kingdom is the sheet of paper now and what you're doing is finding out where's the diagonal line from lower left to upper right of my own subjects so that I can find the transverse so that all of what I have learned of God and I keep on learning of God every day can disseminate through them. Meanwhile, we'll all have some kind of bodily job to do. I don't know what. So it won't be a whole lot different from down here. Happier, yeah. No sin, yeah. But it's free, so it's unequal. And all those babies down there at the bottom doing all those menial jobs, whatever they are, they're going to love the jobs they got. But this is how well they're going to know God. Oh, God, I'm going to see his fingers again in a thousand years when he comes by. Oh, yeah. That kind of their idea of knowing God is that they got to saw his, see his fingers. That's like a baby with a rattle. Being amazed at the sound. Not understanding it, just liking it. The poor you will always have with you. So that's the ultimate integration. Think about that sheet of paper with the diagonal line. And the objective is for you to be a dot on that diagonal line, at which point you're going to get your own sheet of paper, and you're going to draw a diagonal line, and you're going to find out from God who's in your kingdom that gets fitted where on that diagonal line, and that you can draw the transverse lines so that all of your kingdom can get exposed. And you'll be spending every day with all kinds of different ways to get the word out to people. And it will be a monarchy. It will be your monarchy. You will own them. And you will love them. And they will love you. And it will always be a struggle. It will always be parental. And you will be, as it were, God to them. That's his plan. He wasn't kidding around when he said, ye are gods. I don't like this plan. You know that. But is there anything better? Is there anything that will help them more? Look how low people are now. Who will rescue us from this body of death? Thanks be to God in Christ Jesus.